Good morning. I was thinking of this quote. Some of you may know this, this person, uh, Corey Ten Boon. Um, she wrote in a book, The Hiding Place, a story of her father um, telling her the strength that he gives. Um, here's what it says. Father, father sat down on the edge of the narrow bed. Corey, he began gently. When you and I go to Amsterdam, when, when do I give you your ticket? I sniffed a few times considering this. Why? Just before we get on the train. Exactly. And our wise Father in Heaven knows when we're going to need things too. Don't run out ahead of Him, Corey. When the time comes that some of us will have to die, you will look into your heart and find the strength you need just in time. Some of you experienced this today. It's daylight savings time. It was snowing, and you thought, Lord, just give me a little strength to get to church this morning, and you made it. And so I'm grateful that you, you persevered. Um, obviously, that's talking about something a little bit deeper. Um, but today, we are going to, to go through um, a couple passages of Scripture uh, rather quickly. And, and so you just need to be aware. We're going to rush through this, and then I'm going to give you three questions at the end of the passage. Just three questions. Um, that you don't have to answer out loud. Um, feel free to email your, your answers directly to the staff tomorrow, and we will grade your responses and have them for you uh, next week. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but before we start, let, let me just pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, you are so good to us. And we do, we thank you. Um, we thank you for the snow. And Father, it's just a reminder that our sins are like scarlet. You cleanse them to be white as snow. And Father, I know that some of us are tired today. Um, but it's just a reminder that at times in our life, Father, our, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. And so, Father, we ask that you would use this time as we look at your word, that you would use it to shape our hearts, to conform our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark uh, chapter 10. And, and, and or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 11. I'm going to start in chapter 10, verse 45. Um, this is the, the key verse in the Gospel of Mark. If you're, if you're wondering what sum, summarizes Mark, what verse that would be, it would be this one. It's Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says this, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give him give his life as a ransom for many. That's the story of Mark, is that there's this cosmic clash, and it's the powers of this world versus the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And, and we see this confrontation, we see this battle. And here Jesus tells us that the, the, the way that the, the kingdom of God enters in is it's different. So in our world, in, in a worldly way, it's quicker, faster, stronger, better, bigger, everything that's, that's large, but with the kingdom, it's small. It's not asserting ourselves to be first and foremost, it's taking on the humility of Jesus. It's secret, it's quiet, it's subtle, and we see this here in a moment. So in chapter 11, we begin with verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage the, and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back that here immediately. The, the time was for the Passover. We're getting to the final week of Jesus' life. And, and Jesus is making this pilgrimage, as many people would. Uh, the city of Jerusalem at the time would have been between around twenty to 30,000. And the city could have swelled during the Passover week to anywhere between one hundred to 150,000 people. There are a lot of people. And, and Jesus sees this and he comes up over the crest of the mountain. And he probably looks down on the city and he sees the temple, and he sees uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and he's going to her. And so he goes, and he gives instructions to his disciples. We don't know who the disciples are. Most likely, one of them was probably Peter. 
But he gives them some very specific instructions. Um, look here what it says, starting then in verse 4. He says, And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Now, this is what's known as the triumphal entry as Jesus goes and he enters in. But one of the things about this is it's just kind of puzzling as to why there's so many details about this colt, about this horse, about this, uh, this domesticated animal that hadn't been ridden yet. And, and a lot of commentators, a lot of people will say it's just simply this. It was, it was one of the disciples who was writing this down, Peter, Mark, who, who, who was there, and, and they were just recalling what had happened. What had actually happened. But here's the thing that you and I probably just need to take away from this. Let there be no mistake about it that Jesus knew the details of what was going to happen when he, went to in, when he entered into Jerusalem. And Jesus, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth, holding all of creation together, knew the details that when he would go into Jerusalem, he would be crucified. It was not a surprise for him. It, it probably was a surprise for the disciples. I still think that the disciples at this moment, um, they were waiting for a political Messiah. They were waiting for someone to come in and, and clear out Rome of their authority, of their rule, of their reign, that, that if we could just move them outside, then God's kingdom would be ushered in. But Jesus knew differently. And we see it in the story of the cult. And so the disciples bring the colt to him and Jesus, and they put their cloaks on him and Jesus puts, you know, Jesus gets on the cloak and he rides in. Here's, here's what happens. Verse 8, and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. God save us. You've probably heard Hosanna. It just simply means God save us. Help us. And during the time of Passover, it, nationalism would have been very high on people's radars. It was interesting with the Roman government, with the Roman Empire, if, as, as Rome began to expand its empire, uh, what they would do is they would say, listen, go ahead, worship whoever you want to worship, but as we're expanding, just, just add Caesar. Go ahead, keep what you're doing. Just, if you could mix in a little Caesar with it. So when you think about Ephesus, the, the city that's um, in, in Turkey now, and they had the temple of Artemis. And, and in the temple of Artemis, there would also be a little idol to Caesar. Just go ahead. Just go ahead and worship, worship whoever you want to worship. Just if you will, will add, just add the son of God, Caesar. Oh, that's a title we've heard before, isn't it? Just, just add a little bit of this to, to whatever you're worshiping. I think they did this on a very practical level. Because if they began to worship this other God, if they began to worship you know, the, the plethora of gods they already worshipped, and then they began to worship Caesar, what happens when they wanted to revolt? Well, not only would they be revolting against their, nation, against their God, but they would also be revolting against their nation. I, I think they planned it very well, and so Rome had... A few uprisings here and there that we read about, but they could squash it fairly easily. You mean to tell me that you're giving up on Rome? Okay, but you're also giving up on the emperor? Why, why would you want to do that? But Jerusalem was different. Israel was different. They were not a pluralistic society in the viewing of multiple gods. They only worshipped one. Jehovah Jireh, our Lord provides. Yahweh, uh, Elohim. Like they, they just worshipped one. They were very monotheistic. 
And, and so they actually had kind of this clause in their contract, if you will, with Rome. Hey, you know what? You guys cause so you guys are just such a pain in our rear. <laughs> we're just not we're not going to force you to worship the emperor. Uh, you just worship your God and pay your taxes, and we'll call it good. We'll, we'll just kind of look over this other part of that we make everybody else do in the Roman Empire. And so oftentimes we read about how when the governors or the, the, the leaders wanted to make Jerusalem upset because of things were happening, they'd actually take their flags, their standards, and they'd march them into the city, and that would cause an uproar. And so this was a city that was fully dedicated to worshiping one God, King of Kings. But there was a problem. Because even though they worshiped the one God, every time they went to the temple, there was the Roman guard with the sword on his hip. Every time they went to cross a bridge, there was a tax that needed to be paid. So during this week-long festival of Passover, oh, nationalism was high. (laughs) Let's get rid of Rome. And you would bring people in. People from all over the country would come. From Galilee, from north, even surrounding surrounding countries. They would would come and they would gather and they would say, we are God's people and, and Hosanna, God save us. And so when Jesus came in, It makes sense. They were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a Savior. They were looking for someone to liberate them politically. I don't know that they were quite looking for someone to liberate them spiritually yet. But that was their hope. And oftentimes it's been said, and we'll get to this in a moment, but it's been said that the same crowd that worshipped Jesus on Palm Sunday, it was the same crowd that crucified Jesus on Thursday. And I got to tell you, I don't think that's really accurate. Oh, it makes for good sermons. <laughs> but we're in this for more than good sermons, aren't we? We're in this to understand. Because the people that were cheering Jesus on on, on Passover, they were from different areas. They were the, the part of the crowd that swelled. And see, the people in Jerusalem that ended up crucifying him, they were the religious leaders. They were the ones, the priests, the scribes. They were the ones that were kind of shaking Rome's hand, if you will, a little bit. If we could just add a little bit of Rome, we'll be Okay. But we can worship God, but we don't want to make Rome upset. And so Jesus comes into the city and they cheer. And where does he go? Verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. A little uneventful. Here we go. Where are we going? Well, we're going to go into Jerusalem. A lot of fanfare. Just to get to the temple and then walk away. I wonder what Jesus would have said as he walked away. As he retreated for the evening. We don't know for sure, but the next day, the next morning, we get a little bit of a clue. They make their way back. It it probably would have been about a two-mile walk from where they were staying that night to, 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 to where the temple is located. And on the following day, verse 12, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf... He went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season of figs. In verse 14, and he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. He cursed it. We'll come back to this in a moment. 
But isn't that interesting? Why Mark and the other gospel writers would include this event with a fig tree as he's heading into Jerusalem. And then he gets into the temple. Verse 15, And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold those who, who, brought, who bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. There's a couple different ideas about this passage. One of the ideas is this, is that the, the, the money changers there, it wasn't that they were changing money because, again, the city would have swollen to 100,000, 150,000 people. People were coming, and, and, and because they didn't want to use any Roman coinage, because it had the emperor's face on it, they, they would actually exchange it then for, for something else. But oftentimes it would be high um, oftentimes the price of a goat, you, I mean, you know how it is. Goats are one price and then you get inside an airport and it's a different price. And you just, it just makes the whole flight just terrible, right? Like you're just mad. And, and so it's hard to enjoy your flight. It's hard to enjoy your worship when you know that you're being taken advantage of. So that's one thought. Another thought, and, and this next passage kind of gives us a little clue to it. Look at what it says here. In verse 17, it says, And he was teaching them and saying to them, It is not, is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And what Jesus does there is he reaches back and he pulls out two passages. One is found in Isaiah and the other one is found in Jeremiah. Let's look at them. This is what it says. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them a joyful noise in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all of Israel. No, that's not what it says. For all peoples. Not just Israel. All peoples. And Jeremiah, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Taking advantage of people, letting injustice happen freely. It appears that, the, that there was a court of Gentiles at the temple. Because again, the, the temple, the, the nation of Israel, they were supposed to be a light for all peoples. Other nations were supposed to look at Israel and see the God who cares about them. Oh yeah, they had peculiar laws. Don't sacrifice your children. I, I like that one most days. So the pagan nation that was sacrificing children... That was murdering the innocent? You mean to tell me that there's a God who doesn't demand that? I want to be like them. You mean to tell me that, that you have a God who, who cares about you? Who hears you and sees you and intervenes in history for you? That stretches out his hand in, in power and frees you from slavery, from bondage? You, you have that. I want to be part of that. And there was provision for them. There was a court of Gentiles. You can almost hear it. <laughs> well, the, the city's going to swell. We need to do some money changing. Well, where should we do this at? We've experienced this a little bit here at Southeast, to be honest with you. With all the construction that's happening, we're looking for rooms. We're trying to fit people in closets. If you're part of that women's Bible study group that meets on Sunday morning, you're kind of in this prayer room. Where, where can we put the money changing? Where can we put the selling of animals? Well, there's, this place, there's that court of Gentiles. Nobody uses that. <laughs> Why don't we just put it there? No Gentiles are coming anyway. 
It's pretty dusty. Okay, let's put it there. Do you understand why Jesus was upset? You see, my temple, the the kingdom, is not just for Israel. It's for everybody. And you've taken the place where they're supposed to come, where everybody is supposed to come, the court of Gentiles, and you've exchanged it for stuff in the long run probably doesn't even matter. I understand why he's angry. I think that's why he flipped the tables. And scholars tell us that it wasn't just that there was a moment where he did this, but during this moment, this this time where the nation gathered together to sacrifice, he ended sacrifice on that day. No more. We're not doing it. You don't have your heart right. You're not welcoming for all people to come and know who God is. And instead, you're actually driving people away, which means that you just don't get it. You see, God was being robbed of worship from the nations. But the people were being robbed of God. Think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. You see, you have a God who spoke things into existence. You you and I, we worship a God who who tells the mountains, "You, you will be this high and the valleys, you will be this low, who calls out the stars by name. Who draws the rivers with his fingers. Who tells the oceans stop here. Who knows your name. Knows everything about you. And desires a relationship with you. You see that's the God that we worship. That's the God the nation of Israel worships. But what they were doing in that moment and for years earlier, as we can see that it is echoed in Isaiah and Jeremiah and the the list of prophets goes on, is that they were not making it easy for people to get to know God. Instead, they were creating barriers so people couldn't get to know God. They were getting in the way. Verse 18, and the chief priests, here it is. Here's the moment. And the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. You see, because they cared more about their system than they did about the people. For they feared him. Because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city. So as the day was ending, they decided to go home. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, look, the the tree... The fig tree that you cursed is withered. I like that word remember. It's interesting is the story of Mark is the questions of the disciples. Are they are they true believers? Are they good soil? Do they do they really understand? And we know we do. They did. But the author Mark is kind of presenting it as. What kind of soil are the disciples, which then in turn ask us, what kind of soil are we as we follow Christ? 
And so there's moments where he looks back and he says that they didn't really quite grasp it. And, and I think that there's a couple commentators that they, they said it like this, is that the disciples needed the parable of the fig tree to understand what was really happening. Because the, fair, the parable of the fig tree is that God wanted to come, Jesus wanted to come and, and eat of it. He wanted to receive a harvest of people, of food. And it wasn't there. So he cursed it. And the parable then that lines up with this is that God was expecting something from the nation of Israel. And they didn't do it. And in this moment, he cursed the temple. It, it was more than just simply um, turning over the tables and, oh, come back on Tuesday. No. It was the cursing of the temple, which ultimately we recognize that in 70 AD, the, the, temp, the temple is leveled by Rome. And in verse 22, it says this, And Jesus answered them, and, and I think this is kind of one of those things that you and I need to think deep about and probably take home with us. And just let it sit with us for a few moments um, over lunch or, or maybe in your evening prayer time or morning prayer time. But it's almost as if a change of subject. It's one of those things where the disciples are saying something. Jesus, this fig tree, look at what's happened to it. You cursed it. And then Jesus goes in, which seemingly seems a different subject. But I don't think it is. And I think that's why we need to look closely at it. And he says this, and Jesus said to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, which... It's plural, it's corporate, it's not individual in this moment. Now there are moments where, where we are told, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Don't get me wrong, that, that's in scripture too. But in this moment, it's plural. It's you, it's the disciples, it's, it's I would even dare say, uh, moving forward, it's the body of Christ, it's the church. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain... Be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. That's the power of prayer. And as you're contrasting it with the religious system of the day, the sacrificial system that is taking advantage of people, Jesus is telling them the way to get out of that. prayer. Not taking up your arms. Not causing a revolt. But it's going to the one who can actually change things. It's going to Christ in prayer. You're going to God in prayer. And look at what it says in verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. And it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you as your trespasses. Forgive you your trespasses. It seems like there's a structure of prayer that, that forgiveness is the framework that God uses to answer prayer. So I'm going to give you the bottom line, and I'm going to give you three questions, and I'm going to give you the bottom line again. So here's the bottom line. Everyone everywhere. Everyone everywhere. When I look at Jesus going into the temple and flipping over the tables, it was because people were making it difficult for them to come and have a relationship with Christ. The relationship that you and I have with Christ is for everyone. It's not just for a select few. It's not just for those people that can get it together. It is for everyone. It's for everyone everywhere. 
your cashier as you go to the store. It's for your neighbor as you go and, and get mail together. It's, it's for, your, for your teacher that you don't like. It's for your professor that hasn't graded your assignment yet. It's your, you know, it's your soccer coach that yells at you. It is for everyone everywhere. That the God of the universe desires a relationship with them. And I know that there's some of you here today that, that, that believe that for other people, but you don't believe it for yourself. And I'm here to tell you today, it is for you too. There is no place you have gone that is unreachable by the grace of Christ. It is for everyone everywhere. So here's the three questions. Here's the first one. What tables in my life do need to be flipped? What tables in my life need to be flipped? We are told in Scripture that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts people of their sins so that they need to know, so that they recognize they need a Savior. That means like if, 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 if God is using your life to reach people for his kingdom, if you, if you said, yes, I'm, I'm, my, citizenship, my citizenship is in heaven and, and I, you know, it's the kingdom of God that I've surrendered to Jesus. He is king of kings and Lord of lords in my life. Then he is using you as an ambassador for his kingdom. Which means that subconsciously we, we do things that, that can kind of prevent people from coming to know who Jesus is. And, and maybe this is one of the tables that you need to flip. You just need to pray for people. And I, I, I know, we, we say that all the time, right? We pray, pray for people. Yeah, I'll pray for you, and you put them on your list. In fact, we even gave out these, these nice, little, nice little cards. This is our goal. 100,000 people praying for 10 friends. You can pick one of these up in the lobby. Like, I think this is a great tool. But do you really pray for them? I'm not just saying like, hey, God, please help Sally. Sally was a jerk. She needs you in her life. No, 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 no. I mean, like, do you labor in prayer for those who are lost? Labor. God, please. I think that might be a table that you and I probably need to flip over in our life. Maybe, maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. Maybe one of the tables you need to flip over is that you just don't speak. You, you don't speak up about it. Well, I don't. I don't want to cause any problems. You know, maybe, maybe you're a school teacher and it's difficult because, you know, you have state regulations and, and you have whatever. Maybe it's not a school teacher. Maybe it's your corporation that you work for. Or maybe it's, it's something else. And, and I get it. There's, there's pressure. And I'm grateful. Like, I'm, you know, people ask me what I do for a living. And I'm like, well, I get to talk about Jesus. That's pretty cool. And I understand like some of the situations that you are faced with. But I'm telling you, like I'm reading the New Testament and I'm looking through Acts and it's just like, well, you know, I have this choice. I can either obey God or I can obey man. And then every time in Acts, it seems like they seem to be siding with God. I don't know. It's probably because he's like creator. So I understand like it causes some of that. And maybe it's just God. I need this table flipped over. I need to be able to speak. And, and just trust you with the consequences of it. I know it's awkward, but we're not dealing with awkwardness here. We're dealing with eternity. Being with Christ for eternity or being separated from Christ for eternity. Maybe th that's the table that you need to flip over in your life. Maybe, maybe it's this one. And I, and I think this is a big one. 
That, that you and I, we just need to be in congruent with our lives. Like our, our, what we say with our mouth needs to be congruent with how we live. Oh yeah, Jesus loves everybody, but man, have you seen Tommy lately? He's just a jerk, right? No. But oftentimes we do that, we say, Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we know you love everybody, except for this person over here. Have you seen Mike? And our lives are not congruent with what we say we believe. Maybe that's the table. So that's the first question. What table do you need to flip over in your life that is keeping people from knowing who Jesus is as Savior? What about this one? What authority has my allegiance? What authority has my allegiance? Is it a political party? It's interesting when we talk about politics because people say you shouldn't mix politics with the church. And my thought is, well, Jesus kind of did it all the time. Like it's a kingdom thing. In fact, when you look at the Gospel of Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that whole statement is a political statement. The good news, the king of kings, you know, Lord, gospel, like it is political. And what's fascinating to me is when you push a Democrat or you push a Republican on some of the ideals, how quickly they are to defend ungodly behavior. Just because it lines up with you politically. Maybe we should start, start dropping some of these allegiances that we have. And just focus on the kingdom. What allegiance? What authority has my allegiance? And here's this one. And, and I think, honestly, honestly, out of those two, out of the three questions, I think those two are the easiest. Because in some degree, those things are still at arm's distance. They're at arm's length. And, and this is the tough one. Who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive? There, there's an old song. I'm not going to sing it. You can thank me later. <laughs> but the line in it goes, where the wrongs I have done and the wrongs done to me were nailed at the cross. You see, Jesus didn't just take the sins that you've done and nail them to the cross. Jesus took the things that were done to us and they were nailed to the cross too. And that's an incredible thing. Because what it means is this, is that you are not defined by the sins that you've committed. But it also means this, you are not defined by the sins that were done to you. Which means you're not a victim. You have a new identity that is yours in Christ Jesus. That when you and I surrender our lives to Christ, he takes all of his spiritual blessings and he pours them out onto you and me. And we are made new. So I can go up to you and I can say, you know what, Bob, I'm really sorry I made a mistake. And, God, and Bob can say, you know what, Mike, you've been forgiven in Christ. 
You see, that's what happens. You see, the Christianity is definitely a narrow, narrow path, right? And, and a lot of times we think of the narrow path as, as kind of being unfair and exclusive. It is. In a lot of ways, it is. Because what we're saying is that Jesus is the only way to eternity. That Jesus is the way. The way, the truth, and the life. And a lot of times we look at that and we're like, whoa, you're saying Jesus. But think about it more deeply than that. And you begin to see how freeing it is. Because one, we recognize that, that um, it's not just for the elite. It, Jesus' invitation is for everybody everywhere. So it's not just for the select few. It's not just if you're on the worship team who should be coming up now. It's not just for the Bible teachers. It's not just for the preachers. It's not just for, you know, the select few that's out there. No, Jesus' invitation is for everybody. So the path is narrow, but the invitation is for everyone. The second thing is, is that we begin to recognize like everybody gets in the same way. It might be narrow, but here's the thing. Everybody gets in the same way. It's, it's one way. It's through Christ. It's, it's, it's not like, hey, you know what? Um, you need to go and you need to go to, you know, make a pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. You need to go and get baptized over here. You need to go and do this. No, no, no. Everybody gets in the same way. It's, the, the invitation is for everybody and everybody gets in the same way. And here's the key. Everybody can, make the, can meet the requirements. Because the requirement to be with Christ is to simply be forgiven. It's not what you do. But it's forgiveness. So just wrestle with those three questions. What tables in my life need to be flipped over? What authority has my allegiance? What, who, who do I need to forgive? And coming back to this bottom line, it's for everybody everywhere. You see, I, I love this. It means, it means that nobody is beyond reach. But here's the other thing that's really cool about this. Jesus is our temple. <laughs> Jesus is our temple. He says that, you know, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And, and the Pharisees and the re religious leaders were kind of like, what are you talking about? It took, you know, so many years for Herod to build this temple. And, and later they look and they go, oh, Jesus is our temple. It's him. Which means that our goal is not to get people to a specific place, but rather it's for us to go to places. You and I. Those who have surrendered our lives to Christ is, is to go. We, it's not that we try to get people to come. It's that you and I are going out to be with people. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Because God wants to use you to bring his presence into somebody's life. So you, right now, you might be thinking of um, wow, um, you know, Amy is having a really difficult time or, or George is going through this incredible struggle and, and you're thinking in your mind, oh man, if they could just come to church. And don't get me wrong, like I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> because I believe in the body of Christ, ministering to the body of Christ and building each other up in love, right? That's Ephesians chapter four. But what it means is this, is that when you go and minister to them, you are bringing Christ to them. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. That you are being the hands and feet of Jesus. Anytime you put your arm around somebody and say, you know what, God loves you. Can I just pray for you? And that's pretty cool. 